Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to talk about how your BMW is literally just a computer on wheels. Let's take this 2008 BMW for example. It's relatively simple compared to modern BMWs, but at the same time it's pretty complex in how it operates. Newer BMWs kind of just build on the technology of this car. You could say it's kind of at the Goldilocks point in terms of how advanced it is, but yet how easy it is to work on for your average DIYer. So there are actually multiple data bus lines that operate within the car. Here they are. Think of them as separate networks that operate independently to do a specific task. A good term for these would be data highways. Now we can relate the way the car operates in terms of its different data bus lines to a computer of a similar vintage to the car itself. In the late 2000s, this is how they were built. You have your central processing unit or your CPU, and then you have the memory, and then you have this chip here, which is called the North Bridge. You can see it has a cooler because it does a lot of work and generates a lot of heat. If you had a high-end video card, it would actually talk to this chip as well via the PCI Express or PCIe slot. So the CPU talks to the memory and the high-end video card via this chip here. Now there's another chip down here called the Southbridge. It doesn't have a cooler, it doesn't do as much work, it's not as fast. Your regular PCI ports, here you have a riser card which would connect here and these regular PCI ports would plug into it. Your hard drive would talk to this chip your PCI regular slots would talk to this chip here, and then your USB ports, which are on the back here, would talk to this chip. This is called the South Bridge. So you have North Bridge, South Bridge. The only way that the CPU can talk to anything is via the North Bridge chip. So if your hard drive needs to send a signal to the CPU, it does it via the Southbridge chip. It would actually go from here first and then relay through here to the CPU, to the memory, etc. So that would be considered latency. You'd have a delay. If you were to have the hard drive talk directly to the Northbridge chip, then there would be less delay as you're going back and forth. But at the same time, it makes more sense to keep this as an isolated system to deal with high priority, high speed stuff. And then the less priority goes on a different network, so to speak, a different bus. So for overall efficiency, it makes sense to do so. All right, so here's a really weak analogy, but that's a hot water tank. This is a faucet. This is a faucet on the other side of your house. Now, if you were to turn on the hot water at this faucet, it would take a long time for that water to finally reach the faucet and start flowing out hot. But if you turn it on at this faucet, it's going to come out a lot faster. Or there could be a T-junction feeding this faucet over here that is going to actually mix with some cold water and then you won't even get as much hot water out of here. What I would say is this faucet has less latency versus this faucet. Things happen faster given its proximity and given it's more isolated as a system versus over here. Now, if you're really familiar with computers, you'll know that memory controllers and whatnot are integrated into the CPUs nowadays. And there's been a bunch of improvements on BMWs and you know cars in general, uh, but we're just going with this generation of computer versus the way that car is built so you can understand it a little bit better. They're very similar. So this is a late 2000s computer. If you look at the board, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of green space or solder mass here. You don't have a ton of chips all over the board like you would have seen in the 80s. And that's because they consolidated the functionality of a whole bunch of chips onto two separate chips and they call them a set. So it's kind of like it's emulating a whole bunch of chips. This is a chip set, which is doing the function of a whole bunch of chips into one. So that's the difference uh, that happened to improve latency. That means you may need to have more complex circuit boards that are multi-layered and more traces running back and forth to get the job done. But at the same time, it's just a lot more efficient to do that than to have all these separate chips trying to talk to each other. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys now. You have the South Bridge, which talks to the North Bridge. The North Bridge is primarily focused on memory and video card and CPU. And then any signal that has to get from one of these cars has to go from here to here to here. It's got to kind of bounce its way over. And we can relate the way this is built back to the car when we talk about the different systems. So there's a reason they're kept separate, but there's a reason they all work together. And that's kind of how the car works. Now what you'll find with this car is there's a whole bunch of modules that all work on separate networks that talk to each other. Here's an idea of how those modules will look. This is the DME or Digital Motor Electronics. It's going to be on the PT can or the powertrain can. This will be a surround view module. Uh, as you can see, it's not made out of plastic because it's got a dissipate heat is doing a lot of computation but you have individual modules now as cars modernize what i've noticed is they're trying to take these modules and consolidate them as much as possible for instance tesla has a self-driving computer that has everything integrated into one module and has n plus one redundancy it has a backup of a backup multiple power supplies multiple chips for the sake of keeping things speedy and having less information going back and forth they'd rather keep it all in one module so the car can respond uh, like a human but at the same time the only way to do that safely is to have a backup of a backup so it gets more complex 
and makes it harder for the average independent person to understand and work on them. Now let's just imagine for the sake of argument that this was a Tesla self-driving computer. It would actually be an AI, an artificial intelligence based system that runs on redundant GPUs or graphics processing units similar to that. And for that reason, because they had to integrate everything into one module to simplify, you're more likely to be impacted when one critical chip is not available versus having multiple modules throughout the car. Maybe that's what's impacting cars so much nowadays in terms of uh, chip shortage. Regardless, it's time to get back to the main topic at hand, which is how this E90 BMW is basically a rolling computer on wheels. So these are the different CAN buses. When you see high and low, like here and here, K CAN and PT CAN, these are always twisted together. They're a twisted pair. So for instance here, if I look at this connector here, all these wires are going straight in, but I have twisted wires. When you find a twisted pair of wires, it's likely to be some sort of CAN bus. So we're gonna talk about this first, the PT CAN, which is the powertrain CAN. Signals are bi-directional, meaning they can move in either direction. Now, assuming this is one of the modules on that PT CAN, it would be programmed to receive all messages and decide what to do with them, to decide if that message takes priority over the message you would like to send out. They can take that information and decide whether to process it or disregard it or to wait until another process is finished. When I added adaptive cruise control to this car, I installed that module and it never came that way, so I had to find a way to be able to get on the network and I'll show a clip of me doing that here. So as you can see, all I did was just find those two twisted wires off the ABS module to tap into that network because you can tap in anywhere along the way. And that would be your PT can or powertrain can. And the reason that's on a separate network is it's gotta be high speed. So now all the messages that are going back and forth between all the modules are considered multi-master, meaning they all can operate on their own, inject the information into the network, and there's no central brain that has to do anything with that information for it to happen along the way. So every module has its own purpose and it doesn't need another module to say, hey, this is okay to do. There's two types of messages. There's gonna be a high priority message and a low priority message. So for instance, this is on the K-CAN, it's the stereo system. Have you ever jumped in the car and started driving and then you, you try to turn the volume up and then nothing happens? And then you, after a few seconds, it finally happens. It may have been waiting for other commands to finish and then finally, when you push this through the system, did it eventually respond because it was a low priority message. It's still possible to have a master message and then a slave message, but it's done a different way and we'll get to that later in the video. Now you may already be familiar with the term K-CAN if you've ever ordered a cable to flash your car or to code it. Now the PT CAN operates things like the engine, transmission, ABS, etc. The K CAN operates things like lighting, gauge cluster, climate control, etc. The speed of the PT CAN is 500 kilobits per second and the speed of the K CAN is 100 kilobits per second. So the PT CAN is five times as fast as the K CAN. Now this has to be five times as fast given it has to react to different situations a lot more quickly. For example, imagine you have a stability control request that was gonna go through ABS. You need the speed for it to react properly. It makes sense to keep these separate because this could cause this to actually have malfunctioning or stalling if the data wasn't fast enough. In my opinion, the reason they're separated is now they have over the air um, and you don't want someone to be able to get into your radio to then be able to stall your engine and whatnot. They should be kept separate if possible. Hopefully this is starting to make sense in terms of speeds and the fact that they operate differently, but they all kind of talked together, kind of like Northbridge and Southbridge. All right, next up is the LIN bus or the local interconnect network. This would operate on a three wire system. This is kind of what it would look like on the car. It would be a three wire system. You have ground, power, and then you have your signal wire. This is used on less critical components. It's a lot slower and a lot cheaper to operate on because it's only one wire, but it's fine for applications where that won't be a safety issue. So now if you were to pop this mirror cap off and look inside, there would only be the three wires coming through. You're just gonna have the signal wire and two power wires coming through. So they take up less space, easier to pass through as a grommet, less weight. You don't have too many wires going back and forth. So you got the three wires coming in, but then you got to power a whole bunch of commands like the, the motor moving the mirror, the dimming, etc. But there's a little brain or a little box in there, a module that works on the LIN bus to be able to make this all possible. So the reason you'd only want to run three wires up in here versus all the wires to run those individual commands is it's less comp complexity, it's cheaper, the grommet has to be smaller, there's a whole bunch of advantages. But that means you have a tiny little module that could fail, which causes the whole mirror to die. A similar type of wire would be running up to this 
power window switch just on the LIN bus. So when I press this here, I'm folding the mirror. So when I press that, it almost seems instantaneous, but there's computation happening. LIN bus talks to the NFRM module, which then goes in the KCAN and then relays the information over to the module in the mirror and they all kind of do it at the same time. So on the LIN bus, you can consider this particular module, the power window switch module as a slave and the master module would be on the K network or the KCAN, which would be like something like your lighting module, the footwell module. So that information gets sent over to the KCAN. If you're relating this back to a computer, this would be on Southbridge, it would be like the USB port, and then you'd have the NFRM module, which would be like your Northbridge, so to speak, to make the computation actually happen. If you're wondering how all that communication is being sent just on one wire, it's kind of like Morse code. It cycles the, the ground, it's like a switch ground. Every time it cycles the ground, it pulls the voltage down, which would be, if you're looking at a, an oscilloscope, it would pull down, it would be a square wave. And when it lets go of the ground, it lets the voltage rise up and then come down in a square wave. And then you have Morse code, like beep, 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 beep. You got that signaling that goes back and forth. Very basic communication, it's slow, it's cheap, but it's definitely not gonna work if you're trying to use that on stability control or whatnot. You would have issues because it wouldn't react fast enough because you can only send so much information at one time. Now, next up, you have the BSD line. Sim you know, in my opinion, it operates similar to the LIN bus. It's called bit serial data, and it is also a single wire communication that's used for things like the oil level sensor, the water pump, the alternator, the IBS, uh, intelligent battery system. It's relatively low speed and it talks to the DME, but if you had like a major fault, if you had your water pump short out internally, it could actually go through and take out other components and even damage your ECU. But hopefully that makes sense. The BSD kind of operates in a similar respect, but it's talking to the DME by the PT can, but it's own, it's its own little simple network. And next we have the most network or the media oriented systems transport. This is a high speed network used for your audio system and your amplifier, your, you know, your Sirius satellite radio, etc. Most is considered fiber optic. It carries a lot of data, but it's a loop. If any part of the system fails, then you break the loop and you can't pass the fiber optic signal properly and it takes the entire system down. If they built these systems that way, then let's just say you're just driving down the road and you had one simple module fail, the entire car would shut down. That's not gonna work, but it's good for high speed data because it's fiber optic. So consider it like a ring and if any module fails in it, it takes everything out. Now to help understand what is this module and what's really happening inside, when you write software to it. If we were to take it back to its most basic form, it would be something like this Arduino computer. If I was really good and I knew what I was doing, I could actually, this is a Canva shield on top of an Arduino. I could write software that would flash through this chip and then it would take information and output voltages off these pins to add functionality to the car and, may, and even have it work with an existing car by injecting new information that wasn't there before. It could actually be a problem if you don't know what you're doing, but at the end of the day, it's kind of like CAN bus is open source, it's not encrypted. So you can read the information from the car via this module. So if you were to flash a program, and then you know if it sees a particular situation, it, let's say input comes in here, it sees something, it will output over here. And if you look closely, it would say PWM or pulse width modulated. That's typically how most of the signals are transferred through on your car. Now, a very weak analogy again would be if I were to try to fill this cup up, let's just say I need to fill it up a quarter of a way within a set amount of time, I'd have to control the flow and know how long that would take, etc. And then I could fill it up a certain amount. Or let's just say I could control the flow amount or the orifice, like a pipe or the voltage. I could actually have it so that any time that I allow for voltage to flow through or for any signal to make it through, it's just done in pulses. So I can say, okay, within 10 seconds, I'm pulsing it 10 times, and that's gonna equate to this much volume in the cup. That's a way to kind of like on off, on off, because there's only so much flow out of a particular pipe, and that's why they operate at different voltages, in my opinion. So you can control the flow very precisely via a microprocessor. Given these are binary systems, they're on off situations, it just is the most efficient way to do things if you're gonna just cycle something on and off. Adjust the width of how long the signal passes through knowing that it's at this particular voltage on the circuit, therefore only so much work can be done by that voltage. That's why you'd have a 3.3 
volt line, a five volt line, etc. Because if you're going to try to control the systems, you want to know the amount of flow you're going to have predetermined, then you can vary the pulse of how long that's allowed to be on or off to make things happen. And I think it's a result of just having a binary on off system because that's how the CPUs work. It's possible to interface with the car even with this because CAN bus is kind of just open source and free to read. You can sniff the CAN bus via a module like this. So here's an OBD connector and here's a straight serial connection. So you can kind of consider like the commands that are coming from these pins are kind of wired in here and they're going straight through. As you can see the module lit up. I could then take this USB connection so as you can see, I got my USB cable going to the Arduino. I have that OBD connector going to the serial port on the Arduino. As you can see, there's very basic information going through the OBD port. We don't really see anything happening here. Just the same information over and over. I woke the car up. If I put the key on, then you get a slight change. It says OXC5. Turn it off, OXC1. C0, if I press it again, that's completely off. So position one is C1. Fully on is C5. You know, there's very basic information going through, but I am talking to the CAN bus via the OBD connector, but you can't get very far that way. Now, if you really want to, you could find the twisted pairs of wires on a particular network somewhere in the car and jump right on that network. But via the OBD, there's no direct connection to a particular network. It talks to all networks if you have the right communication protocol. You would screw the two wires into there if you were trying to do it that way. But the way I was connected was a straight wired connection. If we do look at this K plus DCAN cable, if you notice there's actually logic inside there, there's chips, which say the right things and talk to the car appropriately to be able to get further down in the network. Kind of like this would be a slave and the other modules are masters and they can finally get the information it needs. You can't just get to all the modules, but you could still see basic information was going through the OBD2 which would be appropriate to talk to like a scan tool to say the key position. So using my K plus DCAN cable with the appropriate software, I can actually get a perfect binary dump from the module. Right now I'm going to my footwell module or the NFRM module to get that information. Slowly it's reading it and there you go. That's in hexadecimal, you have a perfect dump of your footwell module, which does a lot of things like for the mirrors, lighting, etc. So this works on the K can, but it also proxies information through the LIN bus. So if you know what you're doing here, you can easily manipulate this data and get the functionality you want. But if you do anything wrong, if you don't know how to add up the checksum or you make one small error, you can brick your car and it's not for the faint of heart. But at the same time, you can get right to the raw data and make appropriate changes. So why are things getting so complicated now where this is not really as easily done, where you can can't get right to that data because of the amount of damage you can do because they need to consolidate things for the sake of latency, just like a modern computer. And just as an FYI, these systems are not encrypted. The fact that you can get a perfect binary dump of a module is cool, but at the same time, you know, as systems advance and as AI and all that stuff happens, uh, you're less likely to have that much control. But even still, this car is uh, what, getting on 14 years old and it was still quite advanced. So this car really is just a uh, computer on wheels. Uh, even though it's getting on 14 years of age, it still is advanced and really it operates similar to a, a computer. You could say that even the newest generation cars are kind of more like robots on wheels because they have AI, self-parking, um, self-driving, etc. They're somewhat aware of their surroundings. Basically machine learning. Hopefully you found that interesting. If we were to really condense this down into two separate systems that make this car run, it would be your PT can, which is powertrain, and then your K can, which is your body bus for the entire body of the car. So Northbridge, Southbridge relates back to a computer. Then you have your simple Morse code-like networks that take care of just grabbing sensor information for less critical devices. And then you have your most network just for sound and audio. I don't think we're at a point where you need fiber optic speeds to be able to run these modules. But really, you just got your two main networks. They're individual self-aware modules that all talk to each other on a network. That's what's different. They don't have to go through a CPU or a central processing unit. But I kind of feel like that may change over time. Hopefully you guys found this video useful or entertaining. If I touched on a particular subject that you found interesting, or if you'd like me to kind of go down the rabbit hole a little further in these systems, I'd be interested in doing so if you guys want to see it. If you liked the video, please give it a like so it'll rank higher. If this is the first video you're catching on mine, please consider subscribing. I do upload regularly. Thanks for watching.